so hi everyone it's great to be here for this meta research webinar thanks again uh, to tracy for the invitation to be here today so as tracy mentioned i'll be talking about interventional studies and more specifically i'll be discussing a randomized controlled trial that we performed to of an intervention to improve research quality and some of the considerations that were involved in designing that project so just to give you all a bit of background, so my name is Caitlin Hare and I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Edinburgh, working with the Camaradis group. So if you've not heard of us, uh, Camaradis stands for Collaborative Approach to Meta-Analysis and Review of Animal Data from Experimental Studies. So as you can maybe guess from, from that acronym, uh, we perform systematic reviews of animal and cell-based models that are relevant to human health. Most importantly for this talk, we also work on research improvement activities, and um, that's more what I'm going to be talking about today. So most of you attending this webinar probably already know that it's important that we need to improve research quality and some of the, the issues that exist. I'm coming at this from a bio, like bioscience research, I guess, like I'm interested in animal research. Why does that not translate into human clinical trials? Why can't we replicate studies that are done in mouse and mice in one lab? Why can't we replicate that in another lab? But we actually see this across, across all different research domains. So it's not an issue that's specific to um, bioscience research or biomedical research. Lots of reasons behind this that I won't go into today, but the key thing is that to actually determine whether a research finding is reproducible or not, one of the key things is whether another researcher can pick up that article uh, that's published in whatever journal and actually understand it enough to replicate it in another, another setting. Uh, just to, just to um, illustrate this using a recent example, there was a huge replication project in cancer biology it was a mammoth effort and it took over eight years and there was a team of researchers that were trying to replicate 50 high impact cancer biology papers in the end it actually proved so difficult to do this that they had to shrink it down to um actually 23 so not 18 as it suggests on this i think they they were able to replicate um they were able to attempt to replicate 23 papers um, they were originally setting out to replicate nearly 200 experiments and in the end they replicated around 50 experiments. The problems that they had were a lack of transparent reporting because the original authors didn't go into enough detail for them to actually redo the studies. There was a lack of materials to support the results, so there was a lack of data sharing and code sharing. Quite often the original authors didn't get back in touch when they reached out to them. And in the end, they could only replicate around 46% of the effects successfully. So it just kind of highlights this need for um, us to be more transparent when we write up our research studies, which leads me on to reporting guidelines. So probably no matter what field you're in, there will be reporting guidelines that are trying to help you as a researcher write up your study in a way that's transparent and that other people can understand. And the other people can assess the quality of your study and the provenance of it. So in my sort of research areas of interest in animal uh, research, one of the main guidelines out there are the ARRIVE guidelines. And that stands for Animal Research Reporting of In Vivo Experiments. Uh, these are one of the most recognised guidelines in the animal research space. And they were originally published back in 2010. They come from the National Centre for Reduction, Refinement and Replacement in Research, otherwise known as the NC3Rs, which are a UK based uh, organisation and they, they produce these guidelines. A bit more about the ARRIVE guidelines. So um, they've been endorsed by over a thousand journals already. Um, and by endorsed, I mean that somewhere in the instructions to authors, it says you should follow the ARRIVE guidelines. They've also been endorsed by a range of funders, universities, other organisations, and the, the original article when they were published has been viewed over 180,000 times. So they seemingly have had quite a big impact. 
But the key question is whether they actually work to improve transparency of reporting. And one way to look at this is to do an observational study, as we heard more about last time. Um, I just want to highlight a couple of studies that have been done, like observational studies that have looked at the ARRIVE guidelines. So there was one study that looked at before the guidelines were published, they looked at a sample of research um, before 2010, and then they looked at a sample of research after 2010, and they tried to see, you know, has transparency improved? There was another study that looked at journals that endorse ARRIVE versus journals that don't endorse ARRIVE, and, you know, a sort of comparator group, and tried to look at whether um, the journals that endorse ARRIVE have better transparency of reporting. Both of these are worthwhile studies to do, and they gave us a lot of interesting information. But I think uh, the key thing here is that you obviously can't control those two groups fully. It's an observational study, so you don't have total control over the intervention. You're kind of looking back at something that's already been done, and you're trying to um, estimate whether it could be the intervention that's having an effect, but there, there could be a confounding factor that's actually having an influence that you can't control for. Uh, so these were these two studies. And the overall conclusion, uh, unfortunately, is that ARRIVE hasn't seemed to improve the transparency of reporting, at least just endorsement of ARRIVE. So all of this really suggested that we might need a more hands-on approach to try and improve reporting. Oh, that slide again. So that, oh, uh, yeah, this, that's why. Um, so back to this slide just briefly, another approach is to conduct a randomized control trial where we'll have more control over our intervention and we can get closer to a cause and effect relationship. We can get a bit closer to actually say, answering the question of does this intervention actually lead to improved transparency? And that's what we did in this study. So we conducted a randomized control trial of an intervention to improve compliance with the ARRIVE guidelines. And uh, the acronym for this study is ICARIS. Um, I don't know if you know the, the legend of Icarus or not. Um, it's basically about someone who flew too close to the sun. Uh, if you know the results of this study, it's quite, um, it's, uh, it aligns quite well. So we picked a good name right at the very beginning. Um, so our objective with Icarus was to assess whether journal mandated completion of an arrived checklist improved compliance with the guidelines. So our population of interest in this study was in vivo research, so research done in animals, submitted to PLOS One. So we worked directly with PLOS One, the publishers, on this, uh, this study. Our intervention was mandated submission of an arrived checklist alongside the, the manuscript the authors were submitting. The control was just normal editorial processes, and the outcome was a proportion of studies that was that were fully compliant with the ARRIVE checklist. Uh, just a bit more detail on the study design. So this was conducted, um, the sort of sample came from between March and June 2015. So manuscripts submitted to PLOS One during that time, where random, uh, animal research submitted to PLOS during that time, was randomized into two groups. So one group had normal editorial handling and the other group were asked to submit an arrive checklist alongside their submission. Obviously, not all of the manuscripts that were submitted to PLOS One actually got accepted. So we had to wait a period of time so that the manuscripts could go through a peer review. And then what we ended up with is um, a control and intervention group of accepted studies that we then assessed against the ARRIVE checklist. So the ARRIVE checklist, it contains 20 items uh, about you know, different aspects of what you should report in an animal study. Actually, it's not really 28 items, it's 38 sub-items. And when we looked at it in more detail, we discovered that actually there's 101 things in there. When you, when you really break it down and look at all the individual pieces of information, that the ARRIVE checklist is looking for. So what we actually ended up with was a web-based platform that kind of looked a bit like a fancy Google form. So we had questions for each of the 101 items that were relevant to the checklist, and we got a crowd of reviewers to 
for each manuscript, check it against the checklist and answer 101 questions. So it was quite a long process to even assess one study. And um, it was all done via a website. We had a crowd of trained assessors, so they were all trained to a, a high standard. Um, and each manuscript was assessed by two independent reviewers. Where there were disagreements between the reviewers, we also had um, reconciliation by a third senior reviewer as well to check the quality. To give you an idea of our intervention and control group, so we had 844 initially randomised into the control group, 845 randomised into the intervention group. Following peer review and all the way down to acceptance, we ended up with 332 in the control group and 340 in the intervention group. For this study, um, we had done an a priori sample size calculation, so we'd estimated that we would need around 100 in each group to look at the 100% um, compliance with ARRIVE. And what we were actually interested in is we thought the compliance um, of ARRIVE, and I mean full compliance, like every item on the checklist being um, present in a study, would be around 1%. And we were interested in a change from 1% to 10%. So that's what we powered for. Uh, so we thought we'd need about 100 in each group, but we also wanted to look at compliance on each of the individual sub-items, and we wanted to do some other analyses as well. So we actually did up our estimates to needing around 300 in each group by the end. And that's what we that's what we um, ended up with. So moving on to our results, as I mentioned, our primary outcome was 100 percent compliance with the ARRIVE checklist. Unfortunately, none of the manuscripts in the control group or the intervention group actually met that. So no paper uh, had met 100 percent of the items in the ARRIVE checklist. The median compliance was actually just around um, the mid 30s in the control group and in the intervention group, it was just slightly higher, but no significance of 39.5%. 39 On the left hand side of this slide, uh, you can see this is a radar plot and um, each of the numbers is actually just one of the sub items in the ARRIVE checklist. And you can see for this is looking at percentage compliance on the different sub items. And you can see for some of them, you know, basically no manuscripts report them. And for others, every paper reports it. So there was a lot of variation, but no paper reported everything. Looking at our secondary outcomes, we did find that two sub items showed improved reporting. Uh, specifically, this was in the reporting of animal housing. Uh, so you, the sort of cage type the animal was was housed in, for example, and also an animal husbandry. So the conditions that the animal uh, the animals were kept in in the animal house, and these were the only two things that that improved basically between the control and intervention group. There was no significant difference between the groups for any of the other sub items. Uh, another result was we looked at the agreement between reviewers. So on the whole, actually, so this is between the, the reviewers who were assessing the manuscripts against ARRIVE. The median agreement was around 83%, which actually is quite high. Um, however, we did identify eight uh, checklist items that had less than, uh, sorry, eight questions that had less than 75% agreement. Um, so that sort of indicated that some of the things that we're asking for in that ARRIVE checklist actually aren't that easy to conceptualise and people find it difficult to evaluate. They were quite subjective. Um, one of the lowest questions was, is the unit of analysis for at least one test specified? Uh, there was less than chance agreement on that question. So it, it indicated that was a very difficult one. Another thing we looked at was feasibility measures. And because we did this in collaboration with a publisher, PLOS wanted to know, you know, how feasible would it be to actually implement something like this? Um, and the key, the key things to note here were that we found that the number of days a manuscript spent in the PLOS editorial office was higher in the intervention group, which probably isn't surprising. And also the days from submission to academic editor assignment was higher as well. And this is probably just due to implementing the intervention and asking authors to submit a checklist. It just led to some delays on, on their side. 
So the key findings of uh, this research was that simply requesting the authors complete an arrive checklist did not lead lead to improved reporting against our operationalized checklist. Uh, we identified some questions with low inter-observer agreement, as I mentioned, which suggested that there was limited understanding of some of these concepts. Overall, we think that probably a more sophisticated intervention is required to actually improve reporting. Uh, in essence, asking people to submit a checklist got us a checklist, but it didn't actually get us improved reporting. Um, the impact of this study is that it has directly informed the revision of the ARRIVE guidelines. So um, in 2020, uh, keeping, in, keeping in mind the first ARRIVE guidelines were in 2010, they've revised them in 2020, and um, they've sort of taken on board some of our findings that, well, firstly, there was some confusion around some of the items. So with this new updated guidelines, they've published a really detailed explanation and elaboration document um, with lots of examples to try and address this misunderstanding and make it easier for authors to understand what's required. Uh, they've also focused on a smaller subset of items. So uh, they have uh, an Arrive Essential 10, which is a sort of condensed list. And I think the idea going forward is to try and get authors to improve on this Essential 10 would be great. And then in the future, obviously, we want to improve reporting across, you know, a wider spread of things. But if we can just get so, like a smaller number better, then that's that's a big improvement. So it's kind of directly um, had an impact on that. So now, now you sort of understand a bit more about the study uh, that we did. I'm now going to try and dive into some of the considerations we had around experimental design and aspects that you should consider if you were interested in conducting your own interventional study. So the first thing to point out probably is that Icarus was a study done in collaboration with PLOS One. So it was done in collaboration with a stakeholder. And um, I was chatting to Emily last week. So Emily Senna is the PI on this project. So she was the one that actually started it off and got the funding. And I was asking her, you know, how exactly did this actually start? And like many projects, it just started from a sort of random conversation at a conference. And I think a lot of ideas come out of those small interactions that you can have face to face with people or online. And um, I guess if you're interested in doing this sort of study and you want to work with the stakeholder, I think I would look to your existing network and see whether you have any of those connections. And if you don't try to expand your network to make sure that you have some of those, those connections um, to allow you to do this sort of work. Something to be aware of is that your interests and motivations may differ from the stakeholder. So in this case, I think PLOS One also wanted to work on improving reporting and they wanted a, a way to do that feasibly. Um, but you know, we hadn't really thought as much about the feasibility of actually implementing this at a journal. And that was why, you know, through collaboration with them, we factored that into our results. Like we actually looked at the feasibility and how much time it would take and how much effort it would take to do it. So it's just worth uh, keeping that in mind at, you know, at the start of these collaborations. Another thing is setting expectations early. Um, and part of this is considering your resources as well. So, is this something that that stakeholder will actually contribute to financially? Uh, in our case, no. In our case, we had to apply for external funding and PLOS were very supportive of that, but it wasn't as though they had money to throw at this sort of thing. So it's worth understanding that early on and also setting expectations in terms of how much work the publisher may need to do or whatever stakeholder it is, how much effort they're willing to put in how much they're willing to change their processes to adapt for the project and how much effort you'll need to put in to make that happen and facilitate that. And part of making it work in the long term, I think, is making sure that you have scheduled meetings to update on progress and identify blockers when things inev inevitably will turn up and, and make things a bit difficult. So it's just keeping in constant communication. Because this was a randomized control trial, it was really, really important to have a, a prospective protocol right at the very beginning of the study. 
I think probably any study you do should have a protocol, but I think especially if you're doing an interventional study, you really need to predefine your population, your procedures and your outcome measures. Um, and you know how many participants, or in this case, manuscripts you actually need in each group. So the power calculation side of it is really important. And uh, it's worth saying that um, RCTs are obviously used more traditionally in things like clinical trials. And you don't need to reinvent the wheel here. There's actually a lot of guidance and methodology. If you just look online, there's lots and lots of information about how to conduct a randomized control trial. You just need to think about how you can take some of those things and adapt it for a meta research study. We had to take things into account um, from our stakeholder process, so how things actually worked at PLOS. We had to consider their acceptance rate for um, journal articles. Um, we had to accept, uh, think about how many in vivo studies they, they had. We had to think about the time it would take articles to get through review. And we also had to think about we didn't want to stop the uh, data collection too early because we, what we didn't want to happen was for studies that made it through peer review really quickly to end up being over uh, enriched in our population of studies versus articles that maybe took a bit longer to get through peer review. So we had all of these considerations when we were trying to work out our protocol and work out our sample size. So it's just worth um, you know, trying to think about this in a lot of detail and how you can work with your stakeholder uh, to do that. Really important thing to consider is what are you actually measuring? We were taking something that existed. So the arrive checklist exists, it's 20 items. And on first glance, it maybe looks quite well defined. But the more we went into it, we discovered it wasn't 20 items. It was actually 38 sub items. And then it wasn't 38 sub items. It was 101 things <laughs> that they were actually asking for. Um, so you can even see in this in this snippet here, it says, you know, how was experiment carried out? How were the procedures carried out? That is not one thing because you need to answer, you know, what was the drug formulation? What was the dose? What was the route of administration? Was there an anesthesia given to the animals? Were, was there surgery? Like all of these questions were in one sub item. So it took a lot of time to actually operationalize this and make it into something that we could actually measure using numbers. Uh, so I think uh, it was it was actually really a difficult step to do this. And I think it's just worth thinking about, you know, what will your data look like at the end and what can you actually do with that um, when you're considering what you're measuring and whether your outcome is appropriate or not. Another thing to consider is you might want to implement an intervention, but actually doing that feasibly might be more difficult than you think. So we wanted to implement an intervention to mandate uh, arrive checklist completion, and that wasn't quite what we ended up with. So what actually happened was for the authors that ended up in the intervention group, PLOS One sent them an email that looked like this. So it said, your manuscript files have been checked, but we need you to now attach an arrive checklist. And we, we need you to follow this checklist and we want you to fill it in and mark in the page number or section to indicate where in the manuscript each item can be found. We also, um, you know, they also made aware in this email that the manuscript would not progress further through a peer review unless they'd adhered to this request. So it was quite a strong request uh, to authors to do this, but it was just a sort of request. Um, that, that's actually what the intervention was. So what happened in practice is the authors were sent this email. Uh, some of them then attached the checklist to the manuscript. Some of them ignored the email. The ones that ignored the email were sent a reminder to attach the checklist, and some of them then attached the checklist and some of them didn't. So no matter what um, it sort of ended up with, so we ended up with some uh, manuscripts in the intervention group, which actually didn't ever attach the checklist, which doesn't really satisfy what we originally intended to do in terms of our mandated checklist completion. Another really important thing to note here is that 
the PLOS editors didn't check. So they didn't check um, in the arrive checklist where it said, where have you reported randomization? They didn't check if they said it was on page five. They didn't go to page five in the manuscript and check that. So, you know, it, again, it wasn't like a, it wasn't a, there wasn't an additional step to check that it had been completed properly, which would have required more effort on the PLOS editorial team side. So it's worth thinking about what can you actually do feasibly. Uh, it might be different from what you want to do. Another thing to consider is ethical approval. So this is good practice, even if it's not required, and your university or organisation might be able to help you with this. For Icarus, uh, in our situation, the PLOS authors were being subjected to different handling methods. So some of them were being asked to submit a checklist, some of them weren't. We also had blinding throughout the study. So the authors, peer reviewers and academic editors were not aware that a study was going on. And another consideration from an ethics point of view is that we got funding from the NC3Rs. So they were one of our funders and they're the people who actually created the ARRIVE checklist. So there was a concern about a potential conflict of interest there. So we just wanted to run it past uh, some ethical experts to, you know, to get their opinion. And in our case, we, re we reached out to the BMJ Ethics Committee for informal approval, and they didn't raise any objections with our study. Uh, PLOS One also have a statement on their publisher submission website that mentions that they're always trying to improve their submission process and that manuscripts may be part of ongoing research. So they sort of covered themselves already on that side of things. They didn't mention what the ongoing research could be, but they had that blanket statement that sort of made it um, probably more ethical because authors knew there was a risk of it being involved in some sort of research study. Randomization. So this is obviously a really important part of randomized controlled trials, and it's worth thinking about who will actually do this allocation and how will you facilitate this? So in our case, we had a developer as part of our team who was able to create a web platform for the randomization and the reviewing side of things. So um, she created this Icarus platform that kind of allowed people to go on and randomize studies and um, other people to go on and review studies. So it was all part of this web website, basically. Obviously, that required quite a lot of work on our side. It was a lot of infrastructure to develop. And we also had to train um, some of the contractors on the PLOS side who usually check the, do run some basic checks on the manuscripts. So we had to train them to use this external website because, you know, journals don't have this sort of randomization engine built into their system. So we basically had to create one and teach them how to use it. So it's worth thinking about how you're actually going to do that. Um, and another consideration is how you will balance groups fairly and whether there's any considerations around that. So in our case, because the NC3Rs are a UK-based organisation, we thought that the ARRIVE checklist may be better known in the UK and other European countries versus elsewhere. So we actually factored that into our randomisation. So we did a minimisation for country of origin to keep that balanced between the intervention and control groups. Blinding. So there was actually different levels of blinding throughout our study as well. As I mentioned, the editors, peer reviewers and authors were unaware. We had already, I don't think this ever happened, but we had a plan for if an author ever reached out to PLOS and asked why their manuscript was being handled differently. Um, we said that we would say it was due to variation between the, uh, within the editorial team and that some members of the editorial team may um, sort of be more uh, enthusiastic or, or more encouraging to submit to follow certain protocols than others. So that was our explanation. But I don't think anyone actually did inquire about that. But we, we had a plan for it, which is the main thing, because you can imagine a situation if authors if they hear from someone else about this study or something, or they hear from their collaborator that they were asked to submit a checklist, but then they weren't, you know, that could have happened. Um, we had a plan for that. 
We also, we published a protocol or we put po protocol online before we uh, collected most of the data for the study. And we did not name the journal in that study protocol just to ensure that it wasn't known that we were doing this study across the wider scientific audience. We also made sure that the outcome assessors were blinded. So the crowd of reviewers, uh, we did this through redacting the manuscript. So at PLOS, the same contractors that do the initial study checks, they also redacted information about ARRIVE checklists, any mention of ARRIVE, and they would remove the checklist from the manuscript to obviously reduce any indication that a, a paper was part of the intervention group. Because obviously when reviewers were assessing the study, we didn't want them to know what group that manuscript was in. Um, and this was facilitated by um, on that web platform that I mentioned, people had different roles. So there was like a reviewer role and you couldn't see the randomization process. And then there was a randomization role where you could see the, the manuscript allocation. So we, we managed it that way. We also made sure that the analysis code was decided before we locked the database. So before we revealed the allocation of manuscripts, so what manuscripts were in what group, we'd already predetermined the analysis code and we had all of that online before we looked at the data. So it's worth spending a lot of time thinking about how you can actually maintain this blinding across different stages to reduce the risk of bias and how you can facilitate this with your collaborators. Because obviously, you know, if any of these people were aware of the study, it could have had a big impact on the results and they probably would have behaved differently if they knew they were part of a study. I wanted to talk briefly as well about crowdsourcing. So as I mentioned, we had a team of reviewers that actually assessed all of these manuscripts and that was required in our case because we had um, over 600 manuscripts to assess. There was 101 questions, so it took about an hour to do that. And we had to do that in duplicate for each study. And then a third person quite often had to reconcile the differences. So it was a lot of work and it just wasn't feasible within our team. So we recruited a team through um, networks and our social media as well. It's worth noting that a lot of people registered on the Icarus platform to sign up as a reviewer, but the, the drop off rates from who signs up to who actually contributes is quite substantial. Although this is an overestimation, so 360 people registered, but it's worth noting that people actually still use our platform for training. So they use it to uh, learn about the ARRIVE guidelines and how to assess um, articles against the ARRIVE guidelines. So it's probably an overestimation. Not that many people were going to be involved but it still illustrates the, the drop off 360 registered and 42 actually contributed to the study. Um, we kept up engagement over time through incentives. So we had prizes if people reviewed 100 studies, for example, they got an iPad. Um, we gave away uh, Camaradi's branded USB sticks if they did 10 studies. Little things like that really encouraged reviewers to keep going and to reach the next level. Um, we had a leaderboard and sort of trophies on there and we had frequent progress updates as well. So I've kind of put a few of these on the slide. This was some stuff that we put out on our social media um, just to encourage people to keep contributing to the project. It's really important uh, if you're using a crowd to train the crowd. Uh, so we had a pool of 10 manuscripts that we decided on gold standard answers. Uh, to the 101 questions, and these were used for training. So to actually pass the training, a reviewer had to score at least 80% and had to get four key questions correct in three consecutive manuscripts out of the 10 to actually pass. So they had to reach quite a stringent high level uh, to actually pass the training and be accepted as a reviewer on the project. Um, we had a detailed guide with explanations and examples to help support the assessments as well. And people could reach out to us with specific questions that they had if they got really stuck. Um, on the training as well, people would fill in, uh, they would assess a manuscript and then receive instant feedback on what they did well, what they did wrong. So it really was quite a lot of time invested in actually developing all of these resources and making sure that reviewers were trained to high high standard. 
So with that in mind, I just want to um, summarise all of the resource that was required in this project. So over at the editorial side of things at PLOS One, uh, they had to learn to use a new system for manuscript handling, at least for the randomization side of things. And that was a lot of time invested on their side. They had to enter information about manuscripts that were going to be randomized on their side. So there was some sort of time consuming data entry work required. They had to perform additional checks on the manuscript. They had to send out emails to, to um, authors to actually implement the intervention and they had to do redactions as well so they had to remove any mention of the arrived checklist before we would then assess that manuscript on our side we had to develop the randomization and reviewing platform uh, which was a lot of work we actually on the redaction side of things we actually manually checked 10 percent of those redacted papers just as a quality check to make sure that um you know, mentions of the arrived checklist weren't slipping through and might affect the blinding at the assessment level. We had to operationalize the arrive, arrive checklist, which was more work than probably we initially anticipated. We kept in touch with our reviewers and communicated with them, recruited more reviewers, created training materials. We assessed a lot of the manuscripts ourselves, so we were reviewers as well. Uh, and obviously we conducted the analysis and the write up of this study. So we looked at manuscripts from 2015 during a time period. That's kind of when the study kicked off. Um, the reviewing of manuscripts by the crowd started in around August 2016, and it went on for over a year to get through all of those papers. By the time the study was published, it was 2019. So it was quite a long study. It took a long time to get to the end. Um, Briefly on analysis and reporting, I just want to say again, there's no need to reinvent the wheel. There's lots of existing randomized control trial methodology for design, conduct and reporting. Look into that if you want to learn more about different analyses that you can do and all of the important things that you should report. We used an adapted form of the CONSORT 2010 checklist, which is a um, reporting guideline for randomized control trials. Not every item was relevant because we weren't working with patients. Uh, we we're working with manuscripts, but we adapted it and made sure that we reported everything as clearly as possible. Um, just to give an example of an extra analysis we did, we did a on-treatment analysis, which is borrowed from clinical trial methodology. Um, you might remember earlier on, I mentioned that some uh, manuscripts in the intervention group actually didn't submit a checklist. They just ignored the request. Um, so that sort of thing happens in clinical trials as well. Patients don't take their, their medication. So you can do an on-treatment analysis to remove those people or those manuscripts and check only the ones that actually received the intervention properly versus the ones that didn't. And we, we did look at that as well, but we didn't detect any differences there. But that's just an example of um, trial methodology that you can borrow. Um, Thinking about when you come to the end of your study, how you can maximize impact. Well, I guess actually you need to, when you're planning your study, you need to think about where there is a clear need for a study. And also in our case, it helped that the tool existed. So Arrive exists and it was already endorsed by lots of journals. It was already kind of well known, but the benefit of it was quite unclear. So it, it was actually a very good, um, area to look at with a randomized controlled trial because people knew about it, but we didn't know how, how useful it was. Um, I think if Icarus had had a positive outcome, so if the mandated uh, completion had led to improved reporting, it would have still been impactful, but it would have had a very different outcome. Maybe journals would have been mandating that sort of thing going forward, but obviously that's not what happened. Um, I think a really important thing for us was that the stakeholders were really involved and invested. So the NC3Rs, who I've mentioned a few times, they waited for the results of this study to inform Arrive 2.0. So they actually factored it into their plans and learned from it. And through that, it's actually had a huge impact. So it's that sort of relationship building with stakeholders, I think, really helps in terms of making sure it actually has a real world impact and it doesn't just 
it's not just another study that's published and doesn't do anything. So in summary, randomized controlled trials of interventions allow you to evaluate the impact directly and limit confounding factors. So in that way, they differ from observational studies because you can be more sure of the cause and effect relationship between the intervention and the outcome. They do require more planning. You need a prospective protocol, well-defined intervention and predefined outcome measures. They are quite resource intensive, um, and but they, but they can provide you with informative conclusions and clear implications and hopefully be impactful as well. Uh, this is my last slide. I just want to uh, say a massive thank you to everyone that was involved in the Icarus study because it was a really big project. There were so many reviewers involved. Um, thanks to our developer, Zheng Lao, who made the Icarus platform and the randomization engine and all of that stuff. Uh, PLOS One, who were great to work with as collaborators, all of our funders, and of course, Emily Senna, who was the PI on this project. And I'm happy to take any questions.